All right, it looks like we've got uh, mostly everybody in, so we'll go ahead and get started to be conscious of everyone's time. Uh, thank you for your interest in the Global Energy Management Program, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nate Holt. I'm the Graduate Enrollment Advisor for the GEM Program. Uh, we are extremely excited to have you today, so thank you again for taking the time to be with us. Uh, we understand that graduate school is a big decision, not only the decision to go back to school, but the decision of when to go back to school. And with the fluctuation of today's market, uh, that question mark can be even bigger. So uh, for today, we've uh, brought in members of the GEM community just to discuss their personal experiences uh, and why now may be a great time uh, with the current market conditions to go back to school and make yourself more competitive in such a competitive market. So uh, if you are unfamiliar with us, we'll go ahead and start uh, with a quick overview of the GEM program and who we are. So uh, we are a master's of science degree in global energy management. Uh, so it is a 100% energy focused degree program. Uh, we are AACSB accredited. So only top five, uh, only 5% 5 of business schools across the globe receive this accreditation. So this ensures uh, the quality of the education that you'll be receiving. Uh, the GEM program is delivered in a blended curriculum or a hybrid format. Uh, so this is structured so that full-time working uh, energy professionals from across the globe can complete the program. Uh, so how this is structured is in those 18 months, it's broken into six quarters. At the start of each quarter, you will uh, be required to travel to Denver for the four, first four days of each quarter. Uh, it's a Friday through Monday. And during those first four days, you'll have your standard lecture time. You'll be able to uh, really build your connections and your relationships with your students and faculty. And we do a number of things throughout these weekends, uh, so they're very active. And we'll have our panel discuss further about what, uh, what they've gotten out of these weekends and why they're so valuable. Um, and then lastly, with the strong partnership with the energy industry, uh, we do a lot of things uh, throughout the year and within the program to connect you uh, with industry professionals to better help you advance your career and uh, give you the best possible experience uh, that we can. So uh, again, I'll have our panel discuss further about some of the specific things that they've experienced uh, within that partnership uh, and how that's benefited them. So. A few quick facts about the GEM program. Our first cohort started in 2009. Uh, we will be starting our 18th cohort here in July. Uh, we have over 300 current students and alumni. And you can see on that list that our students really do come from all over the world uh, and all over the country. And each start date, that list is growing. So uh, it is really a, a global reach uh, within the community of the GEM program. The last slide before we go ahead and get started uh, with, our, uh, with our panel is I wanted to go over the curriculum really quick. So uh, it is 12 courses, uh, 36 credit hours. That's broken into nine core courses. That's going to be two electives and then uh, your capstone class there at the end. So uh, within your core classes, you can see uh, that it's very similar to an MBA. Uh, but that is going to be extremely focused, 100% uh, focused in the industry uh, and providing real world knowledge to your current career uh, and being able to provide you an education that you'll be able to take back to your career uh, on day one. So uh, within the electives, a couple classes that I wanted to focus in on uh, that make us unique are our travel courses. So we have our uh, Washington DC course that focuses on domestic policy. And then we also have our uh, international course to London, which is a week long, uh, and that focuses on international policy. So uh, those two classes would combine for three credit hours and would count for one of your electives, uh, and which is a really great option for you. So uh, for that, we will move in uh, to today's panel. Uh, so today's panel will feature an alumni, a student, and a faculty member. Uh, a number of you guys have sent your questions in beforehand, so we'll get right into the questions. Uh, I'll ask the panel uh, to come in and uh, first say a few words about their experience and uh, introduce themselves, and then uh, we'll go ahead and answer their questions. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And my first question is going to be for GEM faculty, Michael Orlando. Uh, 
Uh, hey Mike, can you say a few words about yourself and then can you answer the question, uh, can you share your thoughts on key drivers in energy markets and how those have impacts across various energy sectors? Sure, so I, um, I'm an independent consultant on economics and finance and political risk. And then I teach the financial management core course in the program. I teach a political risk analysis elective and then I teach the, um, the Coursera course that some of the visitors here may be familiar with, the massive online course on the Coursera platform, Fundamentals of Global Energy Business. My background is that I was a petroleum engineer for Shell. My undergraduate is in petroleum engineering, and I kind of gravitated into economics through a uh, evening MBA program, actually. I studied at Tulane University while I worked at Shell, and then I moved uh, to Washington University in St. Louis for my thesis work, and then worked for the Federal Reserve System, and that's what brought me to Denver. And uh, some connections in Denver are what brought me to this program. So um, I think the question you were asking is about oh, thoughts on drivers in energy markets. So I think, you know, for me, when I think about sort of the, the key factors that I try to keep aware of uh, with all the information flying around out there, I tend to, of course, think about OPEC because they're the one strategic player. Most of global energy markets are relatively competitive, excepting for OPEC, uh, who's kind of deciding do not strictly to cost benefit calculus, but also to political cost benefit calculus. And when we talk about OPEC, we're really talking about Saudi Arabia primarily. You know, it's their production decisions that really drive what's going on in OPEC. Um, so when we're thinking about Saudi Arabia, we're thinking about both their geo geopolitical concerns, but of course their um, domestic politics are, are a factor. And some of you may have heard about the, the Vision 2030, this effort by the, the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to uh, degrease, in so many words, their economy and move it away from a pure oil and gas type of economy. The other factors, so of course that's a big one, even though that's kind of just one, but there's a lot of pieces to that. The other factors I think about are political risk more generally. What I find interesting uh, lately, and I think there's a, a growing awareness of this, is it doesn't really matter what the formal rules are. Politics are going to play a role, especially in businesses like energy where you have large infrastructural investments and you have large impacts on communities around you. So um, with the growth specifically of information communication technology, which we've been able to leverage and be much more sophisticated in our business, um, political actors have been able to leverage that. And you know we all know how important social media now is in political outcomes. And so that uh, what's happening is businesses, regardless of the whether they have a permit, whether they are able to sway a particular regulation in their favor, or whether it just happens to drop in their lap in their favor, what they really need to be sensitive to and aware of is that independent political action can really affect the latitude they have in their business. And then I'd say the last one is, uh, just mentioned briefly, is technological change. And the two things I think about specifically here you know, the obvious one are cost reductions in solar and wind that are bringing down, regardless of subsidies, bringing down the cost of Im implementing those technologies for, say, power generation. But on the other hand, what, what's really been a huge mover in the global energy markets has been the, the, uh, the improvements in the cost effectiveness of developing unconventional oil and gas deposits. And it's really, that's where all of the all of the growth in oil and gas production in the US has been, and then all of the contraction when Saudi Arabia brings down prices, and then all of the growth back when you know you see it in plans of even the largest players like uh, Shell and Exxon and Chevron, where they're actually setting aside a lot of conventional investments, and they're, what they're trying to do is, is put more of their portfolio into these unconventional oil and gas deposits horizontal drilling and fracking that they can quickly turn on and off, they can quickly ramp up production, but uh, it's, it's actually the cost saving innovation in horizontal and drilling and, and fracking that's really been a big game changer in the industry.
That's great. Thanks, Mike. And to kind of feed off of that question, uh, we'll come right back to you with what type of career opportunities do you see growing out of evolving conditions in energy markets? Well, I think when I think about the career implications, it really, for, for the most part, I believe, goes to that last point I made about the key drivers. You know, all of the, the things that are going on with politics and with um, with uh, either geopolitical politics or domestic politics, or either private political action or big players like Saudi Arabia, there's a sense in which you just have to take them and respond to them and be somewhat reactive. That's not to say we don't, you know, uh, try to instruct on some techniques, especially in my political risk analysis class that help you understand how possibly how to shape the, uh, just for a pitch there for anyone interested in an elective, but uh, how to possibly shape the, the political environment you're dealing with. But the real uh, implication for the kind of proximate implication for for the landscape of jobs and occupations is more tied to those innovations and as those innovations are essentially all cost reducing innovations either in in oil and gas or in un renewable technologies like wind and solar that means you know what you're really doing increasingly is rather than competing on each of these companies in each of those sectors rather than competing on some sophisticated new technology the two technologies are kind of shared and understood what they're really competing on is who can most cost effectively implement that thing and so uh you know by that logic you would naturally expect then that the real growth and opportunities are going to be in the implementer, you know, maybe the less sexy sounding stuff. Um, you know, it might not be quite as interesting as being the nuclear engineer or the solar engineer, at least from a popular mechanics standpoint. But where the rubber meets the road, where these companies are going to make money is in understanding how to better utilize data. So better analysis, but also understanding how to just physically get out there and direct people and equipment and other stakeholders in their business environment to actually get the job done in a cost-effective way. Thanks, Mike. So tying everything uh, that you've just touched into, how does a program like JIM with a curriculum that covers all sectors and focuses on the business of energy position its students for some of these upcoming opportunities? Well, I, I think, um, you know, the JEM program, I would say specifically, uh, obviously is targeted more for the implementers and presumably a lot of the, the folks that came to this, this uh, what do we call this, an open house or? Webinar, yep. Okay, something like that. <laughs> presumably the folks that came in here, some of them actually have technical degrees or some of them have other role player degrees throughout the energy industry um, regardless of that or if they're even coming out as career you know mid-career changers into the energy industry i think where the real uh the opportunities for placement are in those those uh, are with those skill sets where you understand how to evaluate new investment opportunities what kind of resources do you need to employ and then some of the management takes for implementing that so one of the advantages of course is that's in our wheelhouse. The other thing that I think is, uh, you know, most unique about the program, frankly, is the is the pan energy sector uh, focus. So that has two effects. Of course, the obvious one is um, it you get exposure to all kinds of different sectors in energy. It's not just an oil and gas type of MBA program or just a renewables MBA program. So there winds up being hopefully a bit of a, of a uh, like career hedge, let's say, uh, a bit of exposure and opportunity for you to learn about what other sectors are out there that you might be interested in, but frankly also some exposure that if you ever did want to change, you, you could hopefully do that and sell yourself into that. But even more important than that, I think, is the connections you make with the other students in the program who are, you know, you're not in a program that's just surrounding yourself with oil and gas people or just surrounding yourself with, with, uh, you know, with electric power people. You're going to actually create um, professional networks that are connected across these sectors. And I think in the long run, that's probably the most powerful selling point for the program and the most distinctive thing about our program. Thanks, Mike. That's great. We really appreciate that. So to uh, next, we'll turn to Eric Dannens, a current student. Uh, before we get started, uh, I wanted to touch into the technology of today's webcast. So uh, if 
you see your, uh, your scroll bar there, you'll see the Q&A. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, we've had a number of questions already come in, but feel free uh, to use that technology and we'll get to your questions and, uh, and uh, we'll get to all those that we possibly can. So uh, moving on to Eric. Uh, Eric, can you first introduce yourself with a few words and then answer for us uh, do you believe the GEM program has made you a more dynamic energy professional? And can you provide an example of how you use what you're learning in the GEM program in your career? Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Um, so my background is I grew up in a um, you know, conservative oil and gas, uh, relatively small town feel, um, you know, city in California, Bakersfield, California. Uh, I went to college in Minnesota for chemical engineering. Uh, they came back and actually working, currently working still in Bakersfield for oil and gas. And I, and I was kind of studying and actually trying to decide between, you know, MBAs or petroleum engineering masters or things like that. And, and one of the things that I liked about this program was the, uh, the flexibility um, that we had in the different energy markets. But um, so, yeah, so here I am. So I'm actually graduating this year. This is the last or sorry, this quarter. So last quarter, uh, finally. Um, now, uh, the let's see a more dynamic energy professional yeah so like I said my background is in is in oil and gas and and actually this touches on what uh, Michael was just talking about um, and his last point um, it's very strictly speaking I mean this is what this program does it exposes you to not only the skills but also the people in these different energy sectors um, like he was talking about uh, like I said you can you can you know, I have an oil and gas background. I have skills now and resources and networks um, to talk to your, your coworkers or sorry, your, your, your classmates and your faculty members, your staff say, you know what, I, I really think, you know, five, 10 years into your, into your industry, you say, I, I, you know, I really think I have something to bring to another industry, another sector. And when you have the, the skills and the resources to do that uh, after this program and the confidence, uh, to be honest. And so that's probably been the, the biggest thing. I mean, a hundred percent, more dynamic for, for sure. Uh, that touches on what Michael was talking about in his last point. That's, as he said, one of the biggest selling points for this program. And then the confidence that comes with that is, is uh, amazing. It can't be understated. Uh, in terms of an example, so right now I'm in, in the, the last quarter, we have a strategic management course. And, and really what, that, what uh, the professor focuses on there is uh, implementing change um, on an on almost corporate level and really to think you know, much outside your own box. And, and not only you know, geographically, but also critically, I mean, in new processes, techniques, ideas, real innovative um, things. And so I actually just presented yesterday um, to some senior management on an IT solution. I have an engineering background and, you know, chemical engineering, IT is not something I'm strong, strong in, but I was able to work with them and present it on an IT solution for a weakness that we had um, to, to build a strategy on more acquisition business development opportunities that we have and really align the strategy with the overall company um, and it was it was received phenomenally it's great I mean I'm able to put together a team now um, and develop this tool the software tool um, that that I believe not only this company but in my future will will help any company I'm a part of really grow value you know you get to start from the bottom so um, it's been it's been really nice and that that I just applied yesterday so and this is just one example I mean it happens every single day with what we learn it becomes your life you become an expert in these uh, different energy sectors in these classes. And so that's been incredibly beneficial. That's great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, going into, uh, you touched into it a little bit, but uh, uh, can you answer for us, how is your outlook on the in industry change from the first day of class uh, until now only being a quarter from graduation? Yeah, the outlook, like I said, one of the big ones is confidence. I mean, you feel like you, you're uh, able to converse with some of these uh, different energy professionals and, and senior management a lot better. You know, I had oil and gas experience, but you know, maybe talking with someone in the renewable sector or electric power sector might have been a little more uh, daunting to me. Um, but you know, one of the big things is we, we all follow up on news. We read news. You know, Michael talked about OPEC a lot. We see it all the time uh, in politics and everywhere. And, and one of the big things was being able to um, at least, you know, I think pretty well understand the, the complexity in the energy sector. Um, I think, I think I'm able to bring a different perspective to uh, the news or, or what you read or what you hear about or what's being discussed. Um, even in your office, you have a different perspective, a much more kind of grand, broad, um, higher level perspective on the different trends that we're seeing in the market. 
Um, and that's been a big one. And then the other thing that I'd say is, you know, before this program, I, it was real easy to spot, you know, maybe problems or to spot things that happened in the past and uh, tend to be very reactive to things. I'd say for sure this program has made it, uh, me forward looking, proactive. Um, like Michael said, he talked about the implementation. And, um, of course, that's a big part of this, but also being able to uh, be the change, make the change and be the change. I mean, it's a, it's a real tangible results. Um, and that, that perspective is completely changed. I mean, to someone with someone who can identify problems to somebody who can provide solutions. And there's always going to be solutions needed in the energy sector, that's for sure. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. So uh, we had a question come in from, uh, from a viewer. So uh, ask you, besides the curriculum, uh, has the GEM program provided any additional resources that you found beneficial? Has anything exceeded your expectations? And has anything fallen short of your expectations? Yeah, so it's, uh, the curriculum is, is you know, I you can call it 50% of really what's the value of this program. Like, you know, Michael's talking about again, about the resources, the networking, the staff, the faculty and the students, that's, that's really where a lot of the value is. Um, and that's what we've seen. They've also um, extended your network into executives um, across the different sectors we've talked to. They brought in this executive and residence program um, whereby you're able to com converse with senior executives one-on-one -on -one, um, and develop your own relationships. You can take it upon yourself to develop these relationships and even, even as business partnerships in the future, um, depending on what you're looking to do. Uh, that, that, the re the, that can't be, again, it can't be overstated the value of the networking that this brings. Uh, as far as the expectations, you know, the one thing I, I was, you know, coming in, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't quite know what to expect. I haven't seen, um, a whole lot of problems like this. So I was kind of trying to manage my expectations a little bit. Uh, one of the things right off the bat that really hit me was the uh, desire of the staff and, and the faculty and students, but mostly even the staff just um, for you to succeed. You know, everything seemed to be about your success. Um, I even remember joking with one of the staff members about uh, my company going to, into bankruptcy and, and I, my job was fine, but we were just talking about, you know, went through a bankruptcy with the uh, previous companies and the staff member, you know, we were having a, you know, a jovial conversation and the staff member responded with, you know, are you okay? Like I have contacts here, here and here. Um, we'll find you resources. You know, we will make sure that you're okay. And you, you just feel like the, the safety net, you know, that this, uh, program provides you almost you, like I said the confidence that to go and do what you want because you feel like you have a safety net like no matter what um, you know if you if you apply yourself and, and learn what you're you know taught to learn that you that there there are opportunities everywhere with this program and the staff is truly committed uh, to find those and to help you with that so I was incredibly uh, surprised at that at uh, that aspect of it and I, I hope it continues it's been it's been phenomenal so far like it's been fun Thanks, Eric. Uh, so now we will turn our next series of questions over to uh, recent GEM alum, Carrie Dixon. Uh, Carrie, can you uh, say a few words about yourself and then answer the question for us? Uh, how has the GEM program impacted your career and has it helped you reach your goals this far? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Carrie Dixon. Um, I'm currently working as manager of market operations at Excel Energy in Denver. Um, so my job, I focus a lot on policy development, um, not only within the wholesale energy markets in which my company participates in, um, but also at the state and federal level as well. Um, the GEM program definitely helped me to open up doors um, in my career. Um, I think, you know, Eric touched on, you know, the immense amount of networking opportunities that exist um, within the GEM program itself. Um, but for me, one of the unexpected benefits of the program was the number of networking opportunities um, that became available to me within my own company, um, just through working on projects and research that I needed to do. Um, I had an opportunity to reach out to different individuals and other organizations that I probably never would have reached out to or contacted um, otherwise. And um, in fact, through one of those opportunities, um, I ended up uh, getting a job promotion about a third of the way through the program. Um, and it was an opportunity that 
Um, I don't think I would have ever considered had I not talked to this individual. Um, and I don't think they would have considered me either if I hadn't had this conversation with them either. So um, I think, you know, definitely uh, the GEM program has helped to create new career opportunities for me, especially. Thanks, Gary. So we did have a question come in um, from a viewer and wanted to ask you, uh, my professional background is entirely in oil and gas. Why would an all energy uh, program benefit me? So, you know, I think just from my time and experience in the industry, um, there's no one sector of the energy industry that works completely in a vacuum. Um, I think all the different sectors kind of influence and um, shape the outcomes of another. So, for example, like if, you know, if you have an, if you have a position right now in the oil and gas industry, you're very, your industry is very much affected by, you know, the behaviors of your consumers. So um, utilities, for example, like where I work, um, we're a major consumer of natural gas. Um, so, you know, if gas prices are really low, well, then we might be using more natural gas power generation. If gas prices are really high, then we might be using less. We might be using more, you know, renewable resources. So, um, definitely has an impact on, you know, the oil and gas industry and, and, you know, vice versa is, you know, oil and gas industry, if prices are really high and we're looking at, um, you know, replacing new resources we have thermal generation that's retiring and we're trying to evaluate what do we replace those with are we going to replace those with a new natural gas facility are we going to replace that with um you know wind or solar um and so you know the economics of each one of the industries definitely comes into play and there's there's a lot of interplay between the different sectors for sure thanks carrie uh, to feed off of that question a little bit uh, can you answer for us uh, what are the benefits of having energy professionals across all sectors uh, with many different backgrounds in one setting? So I think it's invaluable to have different individuals with different experiences and different knowledge bases um, basically at your disposal to have conversations with um, and to give you those different perspectives. So, um, you know, if you have entirely a oil and gas background, I think it's valuable for you to understand, you know, what's going on in the utility industry? What are some of the problems that they're facing and, and how might that affect your industry? So, and I think a lot of that, you know, is invaluable knowledge that you can't get from just, you know, reading articles on the internet. I think it's, you know, a tremendous value to have other individuals that you can talk to. And, you know, being an alumni of the program, I have, you know, several people that are in other areas of the industry and um, I can reach out to them at any time and talk to them and say, hey, you know, what do you think about this and how do you think it's going to impact whatever. Um, so I think, you know, just having those resources is invaluable in, in your future career. Hey, Nate, can I chime in here? Yes, a little? please do. Please do. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I don't know where the questions are coming from exactly, so it's, it's kind of weird to have to answer questions when you don't can't see the people or know their own background. But my, you know, from my, recalling my own path, I was a petroleum engineer who was working in the guts of an organization doing reservoir engineering. And, um, and when I did a general MBA program, think programs like this didn't exist. And one of the one of the things that I would be concerned about in a more narrow program is, um, you know, this is just echoing what Carrie was saying uh, and, and some of the comments we've made earlier, but as you move up in the career ladder, as you move up in the organization, where as Eric was saying, you're expected to actually come up with and implement solutions, not just identify problems and follow orders, you really are, you know, whether you get that inside of a pan program like this or whether you get it in an arrow or program, you're going to have to actually be intimately aware of how the linkages between these different sectors happen and how they matter. Whether you're on the demand side and it's your job to figure out when is the right time for us to switch from coal to gas, for instance, or whether you're on the supply side and you're thinking about, holy crap, Carrie's business is switching from from gas to coal, we are in trouble. You know, it just makes that, I feel like in a, in a program like ours, it makes that much more of a, uh, 
of an essential part of the daily conversation, the daily thinking, where you're thinking beyond the role of any particular function in an industry or even in any particular industry, but you're thinking at the role of uh, or at the level of how all of these different sectors fit together. And it's really understanding, you know, those bigger uh, interconnections that where you're going to have the aha moments and say, wow, this is an opportunity where I heard about in the oil sector, in the mining sector, they're using this particular technology. For instance, I have a friend who left Shell, who a colleague of mine from years and years worked in Shell, and now he's at NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab. He's still a reservoir engineer, but he's doing geothermal work. And he's bringing the intelligence from reservoir engineering in the oil patch all over the globe for years and years. But he's bringing that to uh, geothermal R&D projects that NREL is working on. And I think uh, a cross-industry program winds up leaving you uniquely suited to, to kind of see and make those connections. My colleague did that after 35 years at Shell. But uh, I think a program like this allows you to hopefully fast track that a little bit more. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for chiming in. That was great. Uh, we do have a, a number of questions still coming in. So we'll, uh, we'll get to as many as we can and uh, keep asking them and we'll get to them. Uh, Eric, this question's for you. So uh, since being enrolled, have any additional career growth opportunities arose from your connections that you've made through the program? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and I'm and I'm actually not even probably the poster child for this. I can tell you stories about <laughs> um, companies that were built in this program. Um, but from for me my, uh, myself, I had a I was working for a startup company not too long ago, and actually uh, used the help of one of the faculty member uh, who teaches the technical course here, uh, who's doing some R and D work in Canada on some in situ uh, oil recovery. So he actually became kind of an informal advisor uh, for the company. And we talked about exploiting a, an, or not exploiting, or I should say implementing an R and D process that uh, he had been working on for a long time and just needed the funds and kind of the, uh, the company to do it. And so we were actually working on a partnership um, to get that implemented. Now, since I have, I've moved on from that startup, but um, we still keep in touch and we still talk about those ideas uh, often. Um, the other thing that I think about, you know, with the connections that I've made here is I personally fully intend on you know, breaking off and kind of doing my own thing here one day. And, and when you think about, you know, doing that and you think about the people you want to surround yourself with, it's these people from Gem. I mean, it's these people with the expertise that I'm going to be calling on um, to, to do that. And so the, you know, the last thing you know, I was thinking about, actually just had a conversation with one of the students not too long ago, um, like we've talked about, there's people from different sectors all over this. And um, I've had just, you know, purely curiosity conversations, um, actually, with a, a woman who works for Navigant that is consulting for uh, utility companies. And, I, you know, purely just trying to, you know, learn what kind of what they did and what their role was. And one of her first thoughts was, well, are you interested? You know, what kind of, you know, I'm sure we can work something out. And I, at, at the time, I wasn't anyway. But the, just all it takes is you to... Um, connect with somebody and ask the question and I mean you're working with each other you become a pretty close family it's you've really good networking opportunities and it's literally as easy as that I think to um, once you make that decision and once you really get to that point where you want to make a career change it really is almost that easy to to do to talk to some people and to make it happen it, it's it's really empowering that's for sure thanks Eric and uh, our next question is going to be for Carrie. Uh, Carrie, it says, I have contemplated graduate school for a while now. Uh, do you have any advice for me of making the decision of when to start? Oh, wow. Um, well, I can tell you that there's probably no real ideal time, no perfect time um, in your career to take on um, a program like the GEM program, just because, you know, we're all we're all busy, we're all working. Um, but I think that's one of the benefits of, you know, the GEM program and how it's structured and the flexibility of it um, is that even if you are um, working individual full time, it's still um, not, with, not without, you know, possibility of keeping pace with the program as a full time student. Um, so um, 
in terms of what's going on in the industry right now, I think you know the the gem program and a lot of the curriculum that you cover in the gem program it's very timely and it's very much related to what's going on with the industry right now. I think you know all sectors of the industry right now are, are facing unique and different challenges. Um, and it's really challenging people to think more strategically and starting to think more outside of the box um, in order to, you know, figure out how do we, how do we maintain our business in this changing environment. And so um, I think a lot of the skills um, and tools that you gain from the GEM program, um, there's no better time than the present to, to get those. Perfect. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, next question is going to be for Mike. We have time for uh, a few more questions. So uh, if you have a question, feel free to ask it and uh, we'll try our best to get to it. Uh, Mike, in the current conditions of the industry, uh, why is now an ideal time to go back to school? Well, I, I think this may echo some of the things that Carrie mentioned. You know, I don't know other than uh, the no better time than the present that there is an ideal time. You know, I think all along the way in your career, well, let me put it another way. If you're in oil and gas and two years ago, you would have said, is now the ideal time? I would have said, well, obviously, because there are no jobs in <laughs> oil and gas. And that's when your opportunity cost of laying out of the market is lowest. And that's why then it's the best time. But in normal times, like we're basically returned to, I think the, the main factor should be, um, you know, of course, what personal things you have going on in, in your life. But how long do you put off this kind of step change in your human capital. While you're working all along the way, you're not only providing a service, but you're getting some human capital. But the question is, at what point do you want to make that step change to position yourself um, for you know considerable steps up in your in your own business or industry? So I guess I would say if you are uh, Nate might not want to hear this, but if you're literally just out of school, like one year. I couldn't see saying, you know what, I want to get another year or two under my belt because I want to kind of hit, I want to have a critical mass of some experience actually doing something, not just having come in and punched the clock for one year and then, uh, and then, I'm, uh, and then I'm trying to get through this program. Um, but the thing is, even if you did that within one year and you have the latitude in this program to do it in a year and a half, which is the way it's structured, but if, if uh, life or business um, intervenes <laughs> and, and you have to stretch things out, there's some latitude to actually slow it down. By the end of doing this program, you know, you're going to have three or four years with your occupational, with your primary training occupational experience. So my, you know, my view, maybe it's because most of the people that I come in contact with have been out of their undergrad, let's say, for at least three to five years. By that point, you know, I think you really have an opportunity to make a step change in your human capital, which distinguishes yourself. And, and it just gets to be an issue of, is the timing right for what other, other personal commitments you have? Because if you can make it work, uh, I think the program is designed to make it work for you. The, the, the um, hybrid in-person online, I've taught in other executive type programs. And I, what I like in particular about this one I've, I've helped develop one that was fully online. I've helped teach in one that was uh, fully in person, even though it was an evening and weekend program. And I like that this, uh, this program uses technology the way I think it should be used to, to um, work around people's busy schedules, the busy schedules of professionals, and allow you to more easily, you know, have a, a substantive college experience um, a substantive graduate experience because you actually meet in person quarterly with stu with your colleagues, with your faculty, and you maintain those relationships over a much more flexible quarter that's delivered online. Um, uh, you know, so so I I think the the bottom line is it's it's sort of a there's no time like the present unless you have some very unique specific things that are getting in the way and and I would you know I would generally 
outside of some specific reasons you can't start, um, like you've only, well, maybe the one that you shouldn't start is if you've only been out of school for a few months, um, or that you can't start because of personal reasons, I think you need to be asking yourself all along, if now is not the right time, when is it gonna be? That's great, thanks Mike. Uh, we did have a question come in. Um, Eric, I'm gonna ask you, it says, uh, I'm not currently in Colorado and I would have to travel in uh, for the cohort weekends. Uh, were those weekends uh, worth your travel and can you talk a little bit about the cohort? Yeah, I'm actually glad. Uh, I'm glad that got brought up. I've uh, I've mentioned this. I've talked to a couple of people uh, in the staff about this. So for me uh, personally, it kind of depends on what kind of learner I think you are. Um, for me, I'm very much a classroom learner. Um, the online stuff is a little bit harder for me, but they do make it very easy to stay um, active in the discussion boards and the lectures and, and the group projects. I mean, this like time uh, put into this. But for me, uh, the cohort weekends are. I mean, almost, I mean, it's, it's almost everything. I mean, they really are, I would fly in. Actually, I've, I've talked about doing this after I graduate. I plan on flying in and auditing at least these four-day uh, uh, cohort weekends. You know, of course, I pay for all the travel, all the flights and everything. And I would do that just to sit in these, in the lectures, in the classrooms and learn this. I mean, I can't, you know, I, if for me anyway, for, it depends on how you learn. But for me, it was uh, incredibly valuable. I'm going to do it every single time. Um, the cohort weekend was um, was really what made it work was that was that you know those four days those, that class time and actually I've kind of joked with them that I wish they'd almost extend it I know that's not that's not ideal for most people but I love the class time. I'd love to extend it if we could I mean I, I it really is that uh, crucial for me anyway perfect thanks Eric mm -hmm. uh, Mike we have a question for you uh, Mike, can you talk to us about uh, on your end of the online portion um, of the class, how you engage students um, and how the online portion uh, of the class pans out? Yeah, this, so this is um, a good follow up to Eric's just to get the, the faculty side perspective, well, at least my particular side. So what, uh, f so this is about the online portion in particular. What, you know, of course, the, the in-person part is, is kind of a conventional class. And I like that because I like interacting, <laughs> you know, with the actual humans rather than being exclusively online. But uh, what's interesting is because you have, I can't really talk about the online portion without a little bit of commentary on the in-person portion, because you develop relationships over each time you meet, even though it might only be, you know, four days over a first long weekend and... Uh, it's five hours a day, so it is quite a good amount of time you get to spend to each, with each other. Um, you develop a, a rapport with people, you know, as individuals over that time period. So I know that happens amongst the students, but what I find interesting is even as a faculty member who only get to be exposed to, say, 18 to 24 students at a clip for four straight days, um, it actually, to me, allows me to make better use of the onla online portion because I know the students as individuals. I can communicate. I, you know, I can communicate with them directly by email. I can think about based on the in-class discussions that we've had, which kinds of examples are going to work better possibly on my on online lectures. I get an opportunity to communicate with these students and possibly have cocktails with them one night throughout the weekend or something. But um, that also I get to learn, are these the type of students that like to have an office hour? Do they want a regular office hour? Do they want to drive it? Do they want to drive group meetings? So we actually wind up having quite a bit of, even when it's the online portion, even when it's not um, in person, we wind up having a lot of real time interaction. Uh, like I have with the current cohort I'm teaching, I get probably, uh, I run a, um, uh, an office hour once a week and I'm getting about half the students come to that and then someone records it and can share it with the other students that can't make it uh, because they wanted to do it that way. Other classes wanted to just contact me whenever. I'm also getting uh, direct emails from students who feel more comfortable kind of asking questions directly. And when I feel like the rest of the class will benefit from that, I have a weekly discussion board forum, which I try to drive a lot of the conversation onto and encourage students to check in, let's say every morning or every other morning. Um, so what, what winds up happening is you actually have 
uh, you have this virtual world that's kind of like your virtual office where I'm constantly interacting with these students. You know, for me, I'm interacting at least on a daily basis with, with at least some of the students. Um, and then beyond that, of course, you know, the student side that these guys understand better than I do, I record videos and they watch videos. So I can't really tell you what that part is like, but I can tell you what the parts, the, the pieces that I use to try to create a real time live ex experience, even though we're geographically dispersed, are specifically the discussion boards and the office hours. That's great. Thanks, Mike. Well, to be conscious of everybody's time, uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, and close here and have some closing remarks. Thank you guys for your time and, uh, and thanks for answering our questions for us. Uh, we'll move in, uh, have some key dates here for you, uh, moving into the upcoming start date. So um, our new student scholarship application deadline is coming up here on Monday, uh, May 15th. Um, let me know if that's something that you're interested in to me, reach out to me right after this uh, and I can talk with you um, about the requirements to be eligible for that um, and, uh, and we can have a further discussion on that. For uh, the July application deadline, that's going to be June 15th, 2017. Um, and, and then uh, for the first day of classes, new student orientation is going to be Thursday, July 13th. And then the first day of class is going to be July 14th. So um, if you are strongly considering uh, the July start date, I uh, want to go into the application requirements for you really quickly. Um, there is the online application and a $50 application uh, fee in there for you. Uh, within that, there's four essay questions just to get to know you and your background a little bit better. Uh, we do require a current resume uh, and official GMAT scores. Now, this can be waived. Uh, this is automatically waived with five years of professional experience in the industry and can potentially be waived uh, with three to five years of energy experience. Uh, we'll also look for two letters of recommendations, and then we'll need official undergraduate transcripts from uh, all colleges and universities that you've attended. Uh, after you complete that, I'll schedule an admissions interview with you with our admissions committee. We'll, they'll just take one final opportunity to get to know you better and uh, get to discuss your goals and what you're looking to get out of the program to make sure that the program's a good fit for you along with you being a good fit for the program. So uh, please reach out to me uh, at any time. I'm here for you. Uh, feel free uh, to reach out to me uh, on the evenings or weekends. I understand that sometimes that's the best time to work on your application and uh, that's when you have some free time. So feel free to reach out to me, I'm here for you. Uh, and I wanted to thank you guys again for, uh, for your time and for joining us in this. Uh, I'll reach out to you guys individually and, um, and see what questions I can answer for you and, and we can move forward. Thank you again and have a great weekend.